I'm going to move us on um, to kind of the main segment of our discussion for today, uh, but it ties in really interestingly with what Valor are doing. So we're going to be exploring what work is being done to support access to the legal services market. And I understand this might seem slightly left field for a group that predominantly explores how innovation can support, support free at source advice. Um, but we, the realities are we know that demand and resourcing constraints on the front line continue to grow uh, with demand far outstripping supply. And at the same time, more people are falling into the justice gap where individuals do not qualify for legal aid, but they can't afford to pay for high street legal services, for example. So our thoughts are that models that increase the accessibility and affordability of legal services have the potential to divert users from the overscribed, oversubscribed and under-resourced free legal advice sector um, where appropriate, as well as contributing to greater consumer awareness around the services available to support the resolution of legal issues. And our hope is that by forming partnerships between our frontline organisations and legal services, um, users with the means and the ability to fund and engage with legal services can be directed to the most appropriate service to meet their needs and advice sector resources can be preserved for those that are most in need. So we're hoping that this session will explore the different opportunities and initiatives being developed across our communities in the broader sense from technologists to law firms to the front line to enable and improve access to justice, including through these low cost advice options. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of um, a what's coming up uh, and what is kind of coming to fruition in this space. Uh, so first of all, we're going to be hearing from the Ministry of Justice on the role of the new Online Procedure Rule Committee, uh, which includes exploring uh, dispute resolution options. So Harriet, I think. Yes, hopefully, or all work seamlessly. Um, Chris, you say our name and we will appear. Yeah. Ministry of Justice is um, here in this thing. And it's, um, it, I met Danae at a law tech event a few months ago, and it was really fascinating to hear um, here again the progress of the end. So, yes, myself, um, Natasha, and Helena here from the Ministry of Justice. We're from we put work as part of the Access to Justice Policy Unit, which is responsible for legal aid, legal support, and fees civil tribunals, open justice transparency, um, and we form part of the dispute resolution digital justice team. So part of the team looking at um, how you integrate dispute resolution into the, the kind of justice journey. And then we have a role looking at um, the end-to-end -end digital user journey, which is perhaps in the earlier stages, um, and establishing the online procedure rule committee, which we're here to talk to you about today. And it'd be great to come back to you and, and this group again, probably later in the summer, um, to talk a bit more about wider developments. Um, so Natasha's going to run through a presentation, um, and then there's some questions that we asked the group within the papers. Um, but also, of course, an opportunity for you to ask questions um, at the end. And we'll try and answer as many as possible. But if um, if we don't get round to them all, you know, uh, I'll pop our email addresses in the chat and um, feel free to get in touch. But I'll pass over to Natasha. Great. Thank you. Oh, and that means I no longer see a massive version of my face. So that's good as well. Um, yeah, so thank you so much um, for, for having us along to talk about the new online procedural committee. As Harriet mentioned, my name's Tasha and we also have Helen on the call who will be um, will be sharing the presentation between us. So next slide, please. So last year at the Civil Justice Council conference, Lord Bellamy said, as we continue to build back a better, stronger justice system, the time has come for it to adapt to the needs and priorities of the modern age. This involves not just facilitating swift online access to the courts, but also providing the encouragement and opportunity for people to resolve their disputes consensually wherever possible. The importance of this challenge is heightened by the continued impact of the pandemic on court performance, with backlogs across courts increasing the time it takes for people's cases to progress through the system. 
There was also, um, we have realised, a persistent lack of understanding about the benefits of mediation and other forms of dispute resolution, with users across the system failing to utilise these tools to engage and negotiate. You can see a quote from Lord Bellamy at the bottom of the slide um, about the importance of there being options to resolve disputes before they end up in court. If we could take the next slide, please. So what have we been doing? Um, so in 2021, the government set out its ambition to radically increase the use of dispute resolution processes, such, such as mediation across the justice system in England and Wales. To facilitate this, we recently consulted on the introduction of compulsory mediation for lower value claims in civil courts, a proposal that builds on the achievements of the government's existing voluntary small claim mediation service. Um, this new policy would mean that all parties with a small claims dispute, so under £10,000, would be required to attend free one hour mediation appointments before their case can progress to a, to a hearing. Um, this proposal takes inspiration from international success stories of compulsory mediation across Europe and beyond, and it has strong support from the senior judiciary. Most importantly, we believe that it has the potential to both help more people avoid the time, cost and stress of an adversarial court battle and to free up judicial resource for more complex cases, meaning that they can be resolved more quickly. Um, small claims is just the start. In the consultation, we also stressed our ambition to extend um, this referral to mediation to higher value claims in the future. And this will involve referring parties to external mediators rather than those directly employed by HMCTS. All this relies on the readiness of the mediation market. Currently, um, what we, the information we have points at it being a thriving market that delivers high quality dispute resolution services. However, we also need to ensure that um, the market will be supported and strengthened in line with its increasingly central role to resolving disputes. Um, we consulted on a range of ways in, the, in which this could be achieved, um, such as working with one or more bodies that already operate within the sector. Another thing we're doing is looking at increasing access to justice online within the civil, family and tribunal jurisdictions. This is something that the senior judiciary are keenly supporting and it builds on the increased use of technology during the pandemic, leading to people expecting that services are accessible online. We are considering how technology can be used to support people to resolve their issues more quickly, as well as helping users to understand their case and what options are available to them. Um, any work completed in this area would be iterative and user focused, and there are already a number, number of existing digital tools online. The other thing that our team is involved in is being responsible for the implementation of the new Online Procedure Rule Committee, or APRC, which was formed as part of the Judicial Review and Corps Act in 2022. Um, this received royal assent in, last, in April of last year, and Helen is now going to go into this in more detail. If you could get on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, sorry, not a very slick changeover there. I'm not very used to Zoom and I couldn't find the um, unmute button. Apologies for that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk you through the online procedural committee. Um, so, it is a new rules committee um, that will have the ability to make rules for online services in the civil court, family courts, and tribunals. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So the um, creation of the OPRC, it's been a long-standing government commitment since 2017, um, and we are now setting it up uh, five years, six years later. Um, the idea originated in the Briggs Review in 2016. Um, it was seen as something at the time that would help with the HMC, HMCTS reform project. Um, as well as creating rules for online court proceedings, the remit of the OPRC now also extends into the pre-action dispute resolution space. Um, that means that it will make rules for online courts and it will also have the ability to set data and behavioural standards for online dispute resolution providers. The aim behind that is to provide a framework for allowing cases which are not successfully 
resolved at the pre-action stage to transfer seamlessly into online court systems, um, which will save litigants the need to make fresh claims. Um, it also feeds into the aim of making dispute resolution an integrated part of the system and encourage its use um, with the ultimate aim to pro provide an end-to-end -end digital journey for users. Um, the, the data standards um, and the behavioural standards set by the OPRC are not going to be um, mandatory for people to adhere to, um, but the benefit of doing so will mean that um, organisations will be able to provide their users with that direct link into HMCTS systems. Um, and we think it will hopefully improve confidence, um, user confidence in providers. We are, I'm afraid I'm, we're not yet sure what the process the OPRC will put in place to determine those standards or how they will determine whether a provider's processes meet, meet the standards. So um, just to um, head off any questions on that front. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the aims behind the creation of the OPRC fall into four key headings. So there's improved access to justice, um, particularly for individuals, including litigants in person, um, greater efficiency in resolving disputes, including lower costs and time to resolution, um, greater transparency, and providing a justice system which can help uphold the rule of law in an increasingly technological society. I'd also add that the cross jurisdiction jurisdictional nature of the committee should help to improve consistency. Um, the OPRC will have six members. Um, we already have in place the heads of the, the judicial heads of the civil family and tribunal jurisdictions. Um, the master of the roles, Sir Geoffrey Voss, will chair the committee. Um, there will also be one barrister, one, um, one barrister, solicitor or legal executive uh, one person from the lay advice sector and one technology technology expert. We do actually now have all six members in place. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to share the details with you in the next day or so. Um, we're just finalising a few bits and pieces before that news is actually made public. Um, so the legislation allowed for the committee's creation, um, but we do also need to, to do one more kind of big piece of work before um, the OPRC is actually able to make any rules. Um, so the OPRC is allowed to make rules for proceedings of a specified kind and those, pro those proceedings need to be specified by regulations in the form of secondary legislation. So that means we need to take some decisions over where we would like the OPRC to begin its work before we put that to Parliament for approval, which we expect to do sometime in the next year. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So the overall objectives and working arrangements, um, the OPRC will make rules for online procedures and services across the civil family and tribunals jurisdictions. Um, we hope they will be better suited to the online space. They'll be more flexible and adaptable to modern technology and societal change. Um, they will have been made with the consultation of experts in relevant fields. And it's very simple that they are simple and very simple, very important that they are simple and simply expressed and that they support innovative methods of resolving disputes. Um, there's likely to be a series of subcommittees, although um, it will be up to the OPRC itself to actually make these decisions. So these are kind of speculative at this point, but we think that there will be um, a role for liaising between the existing rule committees, making sure that we ensure access to justice for digitally disadvantaged users, um, special projects governing pre-action space, technology, data, um, so, as I said, we'll, that, those are for the OPRC itself to decide on um, once they're up and running. So, um, if I could just have the next slide, please. So, just to run you through some of our timings, um, but please be aware that um, all of this is subject to change. Um, we have been having preparatory meetings with the judicial members of the OPRC um, in the last few months to get us ready for getting it properly underway. And we've also been having, um, we've been undertaking some stakeholder engagement um, with a couple of really helpful sessions in March. Um, as I said earlier, we do now have all our members in place and the first meeting is due to take place on the 26th of June. Um, we anticipate that the first few meetings will largely focus on building an understanding of the current landscape, including HMCTS reform programme, digital services, 
and also reaching agreement on working practices, subcommittee structure and the initial programme of work. Um, once the initial programme of work is agreed, we'll start work on the regulations to give the OPRC the necessary powers that they need. Um, we do anticipate that the OPRC is going to consider online court processes as well as the data standards in the pre-action space in the round so that we can test that process of creating the link between pre-action providers and online court systems. And we do also anticipate that there will these will be cross-jurisdictional from the start and cover proceedings from the civil family and tribunal's jurisdictions. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to Tasha to facilitate questions. Great, thanks, Helen. Um, could we pop onto the next slide, please? Okay, so before I um, move on to answering any questions that you might have, there are a couple of questions that we'd like to ask you so we can gav gather your thoughts. Um, hopefully some of these would have been shared with you in advance. But the four questions are, um, what do you think is most important for people when you're helping them resolve their disputes? Is there anything you think the OPRC should be aware of when considering creating a framework for cases to transfer into HMCTS systems? How do you currently ensure high quality services? And what information is it important for you to collect on your cases? Um, I'm not sure whose hands went up first. Um, but I'll come to Chris. Um, hi, number of questions. Can I go back to the uh, mandatory uh, mediation for small claims track uh, oh. proposal mentioned at the start? What will the sanction be if um, they don't undertake the mediative process? Can I explain my reason for asking that? It'll probably make a lot of sense. Um, in OCNC, we followed the legacy approach, which was to say, do you want to mediate? And we were getting an insufficient take up. So we then reversed the question. I'm sure you're aware of this, but others may not be. And we, 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 made, we, we reversed it. Do you want to opt out of mediation or was that effect? Um, and there is still a significant number initially, there was a very large number, but that's dwindled. Um, you're talking about going to the third stage, which is not even not asking even them asking if they, them want, they to want to be involved. Be involved. Um, what's going to happen if they say I'm not interested? Cool, thank you. Um, Harriet, should I, should I turn to you or shall I? Yeah, um, and, and sorry, Chris, it's valid um, you have questions. We, I mean, I'm keen that we focus on the online procedure rule committee, but I'm happy to like pick up questions on the um, right. specifics of integrated mediation separately, if that's helpful. Okay, then let's move to the online um, uh, civil procedure rule committee. Uh, I was part of Briggs's working group. Um, it didn't originally envisage that the pre-issue um, phase would be covered by that group. I think I heard you say that you're taking a much more holistic view of dispute resolution and that actually going to court is only a small part of that and you want an integrated start to finish process. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, that's right. I think the... Um fair to say that the proposal for the online procedural committee has evolved a bit um, since since the I, I, I mean, I mean um, it's part of Jeffrey Voss's big funnel I think it's yeah. any idea that looks upon court is is a flawed system but it does mean that you're going to have to have some structured dispute resolution in order to define the issues and then pump them through to court if they don't get resolved is that right yeah, I think a lot of this is um, kind of we're in the very early stages, but yeah, yeah that's, no, the, kind I, I really thing, that's the kind of thing that is, the OPRC will be looking at. This is yes, not you did hear us fire. correctly. <laughs> um, then to answer one of your questions, um, what do you need? It takes us back to the case builder example we were giving earlier on. 
if you ask litigants in person um, what their problem is, they will tell you what their problems are. It won't have any legal structure. There'll be no legal understanding and it won't necessarily define the issues. Now, if you've got a dispute, say, with somebody who sold you something, you need to be able to say, well, look, this is what you sold me. This is what went wrong. This is what you said at the start. So you need to be able to structure those questions um, on the lines that we were hearing earlier on um, from Vala, um, which means, and I know you are thinking about it, and I'm not simply here banging on about Case Builder, but Case Builder will allow that sort of structuring. Otherwise, the experience, and I was a district judge for years, of the mediation process was it was, it was unstructured, it was unable to actually, it spent so much time actually defining what the issues were that trying to resolve those issues got lost. It's much more efficient to actually focus and define the issues beforehand. And then of course, you can pick up that data and spurge it into particulars of claim later on if you ever need to. Thank you. Guys, um, just to flag, we are kind of running short on time. So I'm going to take one more question from Shalale. Um, and then Phoebe, if you wouldn't mind popping your question in the chat. I've also put the questions there from the OPRC team. So if anyone has any initial thoughts on those, um, please do pop them in the chat. Again, we'll compile them and circulate them. Um, but also something to, to go away with, I think, because um, it's obviously given everyone a lot of food for thought. So one more question then. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, uh, in terms of the... Uh, OPRC and family law cases, because I'm, I'm a family solicitor. Um, I, 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 I can only uh, reiterate what the gentleman just said, the gentleman who's a, who was a district judge. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to work for family cases because people don't know the issues. The majority of people appearing at family courts are now litigants in person. I know because every Friday I go to a county court and we settle cases that FEDRAs, which are the first hearing and dispute resolution appointments, where people don't even know what the issues are. They, they want to be able to tell their story and to say why they are aggrieved and why they are there. And a real person hand-holding them through that. And we, we settle two to three cases per day that we attend. And we attend across the board at various, um, at various courts. The, those cases are settled because there is there is, a, there, there, there is um, magistracy there because these Children's Act cases are heard for magistrates who are superb in Essex and HMCTS and, and legal advisors are there and we're there and we handhold these people through to a final consent order more often than not. Now, that's what you need in a family case. I, I can't see how an online digital service is going to offer that when it's a matter of I haven't seen my children for 18 months or, or whatever it is, whether a fact finding is required or not required. And also I want Tuesday. No, I want Tuesday. I, you know, literally that's the nitty gritty of what a real case is like on the ground. I don't know how that's going to work on a digital platform. I, I, I'd be fascinated to know how the OPRC proposed to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, um, thanks so much for that. And I think that resonates with um, what we hear and we work very closely with family colleagues in terms of exactly how that digital process would look and feel in each jurisdiction or in each case would vary massively. And just to be clear, it wouldn't negate the need for in-person support or the role of actual people in a process. So, um, you know, dig a digital process will be right for some, but not right for all. And, that, and that's very clear and understood. And particularly in family, you can see, you know, you've just given some great examples as to why that's the case. So that's incredibly helpful and um, reinforces um, what we've heard. And just to say, I think it's absolutely brilliant for civil cases. Um, the, the, the feedback we've had from the assistance that we give in court in civil matters that the E&Es that the judge, the early neutral evaluations that judges do with litigants in person particularly, are unbelievably good. I mean, my God, the, 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 the results of those are so positive that, that we're 
you know, we're sort of saying, oh, no, judge, please do this. <laughs> we, as I said, we work very closely with the judiciary. It's been fantastic. So if you can do that digitally, even better. But I'm just, I would really like to know how you're going to do that with family. Yeah. And as, uh, yeah, as I say, kind of, it's early days. It would be really keen. I'm conscious of um, Martha's agenda and <laughs> running over time. But, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'd be really, really happy to come back again to a future meeting and have a wider discussion. We're also planning some more engagement sessions. So, you know, work, Martha and I will work out the best way to kind of uh, join the dots on that. I've popped my email address in the chat. So if anyone wants to follow up chat and Chris, I know we've been in touch already on Case Builder and that sort of thing. Like, we're here, so please do um, reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harriet and everyone else. It looks like people are really putting some thoughtful comments together in the chat as well. So um, it looks like, you know, people are really keen to engage with this and feed into it. So, yeah, I know Harriet um, will pick this up in terms of how we can best support us feeding into it as well moving forwards. Um, and we can circulate that information um, to you all as well. Um, moving on then, um, I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Martin Boyle from CodeSource. Uh, CodeSource is one of the consortium partners together with Legal Geek, which is now running the LawTech UK initiative. Um, in its next phase of um, work, this government-backed initiative will be exploring how technology can be deployed within the legal system to support faster, more affordable and business friendly access to justice. So Martin, take us through the activities that LawTech will be delivering over the next UK, uh, two years. Hello everyone, uh, very nice to be here. Nice to see some people um, who I already know on the screen too. So uh, delighted to see you too. Um, this, um, just having listened into the last of this, this, this might be slightly uh, less serious uh, than, than the contentions about digital in the family court. So um, I hope that's okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, the program that we've been um, awarded a grant to deliver over 2023 through to 2025. Um, I put my LinkedIn profile uh, in the chat. If anybody wants to uh, reach out to me after this, feel free to connect. Um, do If you're thinking of connecting with me, do just write something to say that I was... Um, talking at this forum and that you'd like to connect because uh, I get lots of requests on a daily basis as you'll imagine. So I've brought with me um, a little presentation that I thought we could do. Uh, the other thing I was just keen to put into the chat um, was the website that um, is kind of going to be updated but it's got a little bit of the detail of what we're doing um, for LawTech UK. Um, hey Sarah, nice to see you. Um, uh, into the chat for everybody to have a look at. Um, and then I've got three pages of presentation and a little bit of time for questions. And then hopefully uh, that'll be uh, you dispensing with me. Um, so if I... Um, sharing screen is different on the, when you do a webinar than I was used to. Just one moment whilst I uh, sort out that I'm not going to share with you any confidential stuff or stuff that you don't want to see on my screen. All right. Um, So uh, forgive me um, for the brief disruption. All right, turns out that my IT person has locked it down. I'm going to talk to you about what we're going to do rather than show you. Uh, so that was handy. I should have probably thought of that a little before. So um, as per my intro, uh, we've taken over the um, running of LawTech UK from Tech Nation. We started doing that in um, April of this year after winning the grant that the MOJ put forward uh, at the end of last year. Uh, it's important to note that the, um, while there are the consortium, so there are two companies that are running this, there's us and uh, Legal Geek, who many of you will be familiar with. Many of you um, will have been to their conferences. I think they had their High Street Law um, conference yesterday. Um, is that we try to kind of take on um, the work that Tech Nation had done and build on the success that they'd had and bring our own flavor to that. So the objectives that the MOJ have set us are um, to engage, inspire, and educate a scaled and interconnected law tech ecosystem. So it has the culture, expertise, and confidence to use law tech innovation to variously drive and grow the growth for the UK, inspire greater confidence in the legal system and UK democracy, and incentivize the use of UK law and encourages the co-creation of innovative systems. So you can see that that's all about um, how technology can take forward some of the agenda that the Ministry of Justice has specifically with technology companies. Uh, like I was just um, uh, logging in when uh, Danae, who is 
you know, known to us because uh, she's based in Edinburgh, um, was chatting about Valor uh, to create opportunities for businesses like that to kind of step out of the ecosystem and to grow. Uh, and the consortium is put together from two perspectives. So we we partner up with Legal Geek because we think that there's a really nice division of labor between what they're good at and what we are good at. So just to give you a little bit of context there is that uh, my company Codebase has been uh, working in Edinburgh's tech ecosystem since 2014. Um, I might uh, even indulge you slightly and say that we were based in Central Edinburgh. If you, uh, if you look out the window, there's Edinburgh Castle directly out the window. Um, and we have about um, 80 companies in our, uh, in the, the building that I'm in is much nicer to look out of than it is to look at. Um, so it's kind of a 1970s Department of uh, Social Services building where people used to get their unemployment benefit. Uh, so it's pretty functional. But we've got 100 uh, tech startups that are headquartered here building products of, uh, for, for various purposes. So Codebase is primarily a, a tech incubator. And Legal Geek uh, founded the world's first law tech uh, conference uh, about seven years ago. Uh, and runs an event in Europe and in the USA. So you'll be familiar with the work that they do, but perhaps less so with us. Um, so we've divided up the deliverables that we've um, identified for the LawTech UK program into four boxes. Uh, they're community and communications. Uh, we are running education programs. We're going to do some innovation, which we call our bridge program, and some thought leadership. So um, had had the internet gods been kinder to me, you'd be able to see that. But uh, in the interest of uh, just doing it quickly, I may well just talk you through it. Um, so from a, from a community and communications uh, process, uh, we're going to produce a law tech map, an annual report. Uh, we're going to build an online community. Uh, the website is being developed and will be ready in the middle of July. So it's probably worthwhile uh, keeping in mind the URL that I shared in the chat because that's going to have more opportunities to um, interact with LawTech UK uh, in the coming month. Um, there's a LawTech UK tour which has already started. So if you click through on the link, you'll see that the next event, we had our launch event in Edinburgh last month. We'll have another event in Cardiff um, next month. Uh, and the plan there is to try and uh, focus on the parts of the UK, which are probably a little bit less well served uh, than um, they have been in the past. So to try and make this deliberately a UK wide proposition rather than something which is um, uh, based out of and administered to people who live in the southeast. I'm particularly empathetic to that cause because I used to spend a great deal of my time traveling from Edinburgh to London on the train to go to events. Um, and there'll be a lot of promotion that's coming up. So if you if you kind of um, find LawTech UK on social media, whether that be if you choose LinkedIn or Twitter to follow us, then there'll be an opportunity for you to keep up to date with what it is that we're doing. Talking particularly about the work that Codebase is going to be doing, we're, we're a startup accelerator and we're particularly focused on early stage companies. So we believe that the way that you can build um, a good company is teachable and we seek over the next couple of years to get people who are already existing in the legal ecosystem and encourage them to build products and services, whether that's a company or to um, kind of facilitate better use of technology in their own company or to come up with a product which is pertinent for a specific niche that they understand better. And we're going to do that in, in a couple of ways. So in the first instance, that would be um, to help startups who are uh, potentially people who are working in organizations or people with great ideas who have never thought about starting a tech company of their own. Um, and we'll have a program called LawTech Basics. And LawTech Basics will help you to kind of follow some um, online guided tutorials to help you to work out how it is that people who build great tech companies come up with ideas and some of the early stage thinking that they do to formulate their thoughts. So that'll be self-guided and, and normally on your own. Then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll be holding, holding a cohort-based program. And again, that'll be UK-wide, so likely to be based online called LawTech First Steps. Um, and for anybody who knows anything about technology, um, there's a thing called the Minimum Viable Product. Uh, and that's the kind of the basis on which your company will be built before you get any real investment or any real traction in the marketplace. So LawTech first steps will be for people who have got a little bit further than that, have come up with an idea, and we'll take them to the point where we can accelerate their growth so that they've got something that they can show somebody uh, and a minimum viable product. Um, and then there'll be a follow up on that, which will be called first uh, LawTech next steps which takes you beyond that low fidelity minimum viable product to a place where you've got a product, you understand what your total addressable market is and how it could be that you could either uh, raise investment through um, external funding or you can uh, bootstrap your company to kind of pay for itself as it goes, goes forward. 
And the link between all of that will be a mentoring program, which is already open to people to apply for on the website. So if you'd like to, if you've got a company already, or you've got a technology idea that you think you'd like some um, expert mentoring in, you can apply via our website to register interest for mentoring in the future. Then the second component, so that's all wrapped up in pre-stage. The second component is something that we call our bridge program. Uh, bridge program seeks to bring together um, established businesses, people who have got tenure, incumbent businesses in the law. And that doesn't just mean law firms. That can be anybody who's got um, tenure in the industry with domain expertise. And to run an accelerator program where we put those tenured in incumbent businesses in the same room as, uh, as startups who have got early stage ideas to help them to work more effectively together. Um, one of the things that we're really conscious of at Codebase is the fact that it's quite difficult for early stage uh, tech companies to work with um, tenured uh, incumbent companies because there's a big mismatch. The premise on which we build many of these programs is actually um, bearing in mind that we don't just do them in law, we do them in health and agriculture and energy, is that um, we say that big companies don't know how to buy and that small companies don't know how to sell. And you can either agree with that or disagree with that. I'm not sure that we really mind. Um, but what it does do is it provokes a conversation as to where the mismatch points are. So we run a program um, across 10 months where we bring together the incumbent companies or the incumbent individuals um, and the startups, and we teach them together as to how they might work better and to build better products. So we think that you can have four ways that you can work with a, a small company. If you're a, an incumbent, you can build something yourself or together. You can partner, you can make an acquisition, or you can make an investment. And this program seeks to kind of help both parties to work out which is best for them, but ultimately to build really uh, valuable products that the market needs, uh, rather than to build something that uh, you think is great, but nobody else really wants, and to do it in a low risk and a low cost way. And then the final component of our program is around about thought leadership, uh, and that is to work with the UK Jurisdictional Task Force. They've got, um, they're probably, uh, you'll be familiar with some of the work through the previous incarnation of Law Tech UK. There'll be an authoritative statement um, issued by um, the Master of the Rules Office, uh, probably towards the beginning of 2024, and we're working on what that might be. And um, it wouldn't be a Law Tech program if there wasn't something about generative AI, and we're going to run an event uh, probably in the autumn of 2023 about generative AI, uh, likely to bring together the legal component and the technical component, because we think that where uh, this discussion's probably been a little bit missing in the past is that lots of people are talking about why the technology is dangerous without really understanding uh, how the technology is built. So our endeavor there is to bring together both parties and have a meaningful discussion about what not only are the concerns but what the opportunities are and also around about why regulation may or may not be a good or a bad thing depending on which kind of side of the world you're looking at the problem um and that is um that's kind of it in a nutshell that's me talked for a long time just aware that i probably chatted there for like six minutes or so without stopping um so happy to um kind of briefly take any questions or comments um just to say that we we've only just had the delivery plan approved so that's probably why if you are um unfamiliar with this um that you won't have seen very much of it out there we haven't yet been able to kind of broadcast it because the moj signed off our delivery plan only this week so expect much more in the very near future martin thank you so much and yeah we really look forward to to seeing the developments from this initiative growing um and look forward to seeing more about how our communities kind of overlap and can engage with each other around these kinds of solutions to improve access to justice services, essentially. But yeah, we'll wait for um, that announcement and hopefully we'll be able to have you back um, as our ability to engage with the programme as it moves forward goes on. Um, Love you, Mark. Thank you. Any questions for Martin, please do pop them in the chat. Um, we can kind of go back and follow up. But for the time being, um, I'm really keen to move on to uh, our next presenter. Um, we're going to learn a little bit more about um, what actually exists out in the community already. Uh, delighted to welcome Lisa, Lisa Hilda from the Affordable Justice Programme at Winner, the Preston Women Road Women's Centre, to give us an insight into how their not-profit pricing model is helping women across the UK. So, yes, my name's Lisa Hilda. I'm one of the directors and trustees of Affordable Justice, which is um, based in Hull at Preston Road Women's Centre. We're a women-only law firm, alternative business structure and registered charity. And 
we provide family law solutions for women and children in England and Wales. So we were set up as a, a response to LASPO and the reduction in eligibility to legal aid for women and um, in particular women fleeing domestic abuse. And what we were seeing through the Women's Centre is that um, the choices facing women who um, had fallen out of that eligibility were that they were um, forced to pay commercial prices for legal services, typically these days £350 an hour plus VAT. Um, and this was being financed through borrowing, sometimes unaffordable borrowing through credit cards, doorstep loans, um, family and friends. We had one woman whose um, mother cashed in her pension scheme in order to fund um, uh, a family law proceedings um, to do with children and um, divorce settlement. And um, we felt that that was wholly unacceptable um, and disproportionately affecting women. Um, they were either then forced to drop the proceedings, um, often child proceedings that were geared towards family safety, um, leaving them exposed to ongoing risk from perpetrators or um, represent themselves in court, litigants in person, um, and potentially having to face their perpetrator in court, um, a significantly daunting and sometimes unsafe environment. So all of these things we felt needed addressing and we set up affordable justice in response. Um, and what we provide is specialist legal advice and representation from experts in the field. So our lawyers and support staff are um, veteran family law practitioners and um, have uh, a wealth of experience in this field. Um, the hourly rates that we charge are less than a third of high street prices and we're able to do that because we simply stripped out the profit. Um, our business model is based on a break-even financial business model um, and we don't seek to um, take any money out of that uh, business. We simply want to cover our costs. And those costs include paying our lawyers and support staff at market rates or above market rates to ensure that they're not forced to be disadvantaged by working for a charity or addressing this need um, around uh, disadvantage uh, for women. Um, the service is accessible. We can offer face-to-face -face appointments, phone, Teams, Zoom, etc. at times that are convenient and family friendly. Um, and for those women who we do see face to face, there's an on-site nursery for women with young kids so that they can um, see our solicitor talk about very adult um, issues and um, still know that their children are being looked after in a registered nursery. Uh, we've been operating since February 2016. Um, that's when we got our licence and um, developed the service in Hull, um, but we uh, expanded to include anywhere in England and Wales since 2021. And that was really as a result of the opportunities uh, provided by the pandemic for more online consultations and online court proceedings. And in that time, we've helped more than 1,100 women um, get some great outcomes uh, for themselves and for their families. And we're very much geared towards an empowerment model of delivery um, underpinned by a feminist ethos of practice. So what that means in this context is that we very much listen to 
the women that we're working with to understand what are the outcomes they want to achieve rather than um, uh, the some of the experiences that um, some of our clients had previously with commercial law firms who um, for want of a better phrase dictated to them what they could get and forged ahead with that without properly listening to what women wanted. Uh, we offer a full range of family law interventions, non moles um, children's proceedings, divorce, separation, financial settlements, um, and therefore we can offer quite a holistic service for women who've come out of violent relationships or indeed women who simply want um, a family friendly and um, empowerment based uh, set of interventions um, for themselves. And our business model is financially sustainable. Our charge out rates cover all of our costs. Um, so we're not reliant on grant funding at all. Um, our solicitors uh, are not forced to work all the hours that God sends. Uh, in order to meet uh, financial targets. We have a really um, healthy balance between focused work and family life um, and flexible working practices for the women that we employ. Um, and we deliberately set it up in that way because um, we wanted affordable justice to be available in the long term. Um, and thus far we've um, not only been able to expand, we're increasing our reach across England and Wales and looking to um, employ further solicitors and further support staff now because um, the word's getting out and women want to come to us as an affordable solution. So that was a very quick summary of who we are and what we do. I'll put the the link in the chat, but happy to a answer any questions that people might have at this point. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I would really encourage uh, people to go and check this service out. It was really new to me um, and um, it was great to um, learn more about it and talk with uh, Lisa and Sue about their approach, which is so integral to um, what they're doing for the women they support um, and also more broadly for their community. And most importantly of all, I know it's something that we've kind of come to a couple of times um, about the sustainability of affordable access to justice models. Um, this is a really successful demonstration of that. I think, um, Lisa, I know um, I've got a couple of uh, links that you circulated to me as well, including the evaluation report of Affordable Justice, which is a really great read. So if it's all right with you guys. I will circulate that with you afterwards as well. That's um, great. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, Lisa. Lovely to have you. Um, just before we close out, I appreciate we're really short on time and um, I wanted to give the opportunity to Law for Life to um, share a little bit of information about um, their uh, briefing, about their affordable advice project, which is now in its second year. This is a service provided by Law for Life in partnership with Resolution. Um, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to have Emmeline share the link in the chat to that uh, research briefing. It chimes with a lot of the stuff that we've been discussing today. Um, it really um, kind of strengthens that message around access to affordable advice initiatives um, and how important they are and how they can work alongside and within um, advice organisations as well. So Emmeline, if you wouldn't mind popping the link to that in the chat just now um, so people have a chance to access it before we close out the meeting. Um, but I do want to make sure that we end on time. So I'm going to round up there and just say a huge thanks to all of our amazing contributors today. Thank you again for taking the time to share your learnings and your experiences with the rest of the community. Um, and thanks to everyone who was so active on the chat as well um, in sharing their updates and insights. Um, we hope to continue these discussions. So we will take all the information that's been shared and follow up with our presenters and follow up with our future meetings as well. 
the next meeting of this group will be in September on Thursday the 7th at the same time always 10 to 11.30. It's currently a free, free slot so we don't have anything pre-booked in so if there are things that you want us to pick up to discuss further, to dedicate more time to, to have a bit more discussion around, please do let me know um, and we can make sure the next session is doing everything we need to do um, for you guys to make it as useful as possible. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to wish you all a very happy Thursday and rest of your week and weekend. Thank you all so much again uh, for coming this morning and I will look forward to seeing more at future events. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Bye! -bye.